Uh, I'll mostly go back uh, and carry on from where I left yesterday, as usual, unless there are questions that were not answered and left completely left you completely in the dark. Uh, were about yesterday's lectures, or even earlier lectures for that matter. Any burning question? Good. Uh, so, we were yesterday discussing proton-proton collisions, okay? Uh, <laughs> so, the, the one thing I, I forgot to mention yesterday, I apologize for this, and, and I had a few questions about that afterwards, so I guess if I had a few questions for means it probably was not totally obvious for more than, than the people who asked. Uh, I told you at the end, uh, initially, that you can always try it. The math formula is essentially writing down the cross-section as uh, some sum over over incoming flavors, uh, PDFs for those two guys. And some cross-section which depends, some partonic level cross-section which depends on, uh, potentially on and of s, yeah, there's probably some mu r square dependence that I forgot to mention. Uh, so obviously PDF also depends on the value of alpha s you want, so there's an extra dependent on alpha s and the PDF, which I haven't explicitly written here. But anyway, you know that you have to somehow reabsorb UV divergences inside, uh, inside your definition of the coupling, so alpha s picks up a, defending, a dependence on the running, uh, on the specific ch scale you choose to uh, to do that reabsorption of divergences, and as a consequence, uh, if you may be left with uh, some dependence which is going to get a log of some some scale, whatever, over mu r squared, which is what's left over after if you reabsorb the divergent part in alpha s, you're left with potentially some logs. Hopefully these logs are, lot, uh, are not large, so at the end of the day it means that you have chosen your mu r scale correctly for the process of interest. Uh, similar thing from mu f, if you remember what we said in divina 6 scattering, you need to, to reabsorb the divergences of the collinear emissions inside the parton distribution function. So you choose mu f so that at the end of the day, these guys are finite, but you may be left with some log of some scale over mu f squared inside your, inside your cross-section. Uh, the same way that if you remember when we did f2, you could choose mu f to be whatever you want, and then you're left with a log of q squared over mu f squared inside your, uh, inside your uh, description of f2. If you choose mu f squared to be q squared, these logs disappear, and if you choose, so a, a natural right choice is to take mu f squared to be of the order of q squared, let it be maybe within a constant, so that all the logs are actually hidden either in, so infrared logs, screen R logs are hidden in PDFs, uh, UV logs are hidden in alpha s, and all the cross-section you get there is smooth and finite with no big corrections that you should worry about. Uh, now, at the end of the day, you still need to choose a scale, right? You need to choose these two scale. And typically, if there is some hard scale, if sigma hat, if the partonic process involves some hard scale that I will denote by q square, typically you're going to take mu f squared and mu r squared to be of the order of q squared, all right? And Typically, what you're going to do is say, well, I'm going to truncate this at a given order of Bergen theory, and wherever I vary mu f square and mu r square up to constant factors around that r scale q squared, I'm always going to get something which is at the accuracy I'm working with. So imagine I'm doing NLO, and NLO is alpha squared. At the accuracy alpha squared, I'm also, well, and well, you include PFs in the initial state, so maybe alpha squared might be. Let's say alpha q for the sake of, of clarity. So Im imagine the, N the NLO is starts at alpha cube, then uh, whichever choice you make for the factorization and normalization scale, your result is always going to be accurate at alpha cube, because essentially the variation that you'll get by changing the scales, say in mu f, are going to compensate the variations you make by changing mu f here, so that at the end of the day everything's perfect at NLO. 
On the other hand, if you start varying mu f and mu r square, that's going to generate higher order corrections, and that's something that people tend to use to estimate uncertainties on their calculation. So if you want to make a fixed order prediction for some observable, you're going to have a central value which is going to get, be obtained by taking mu f and mu r square equals q squared, and then you're going to vary mu f and mu r up and down essentially by factors of two, and that's going to generate essentially something which is the same, same accuracy, but generate higher order corrections, which will give you an, an, an idea of what you've been missing from higher order corrections, so an uncertainty on the perturbative expansion of, of, of the f an uncertainty related to the fact that you've trun truncated your series. So typically when you do that, every theory prediction here has an uncertainty which include varying mu f and mu r, uh, typically by factors of two up and down, and varying the PDFs. So remember, there are uncertainties in the determination of the PDF, as I told you yesterday. PDFs are naturally fitted to data, so have some uncertainty. And typically, your theory uncertainty should include these two, uh, these two scan variations, okay? So this is really trying to estimate, based on, for a given order of perturbation theory, what are the theory uncertainties that you have, either by poor knowledge of the PDF, or by the fact that you've truncated your series to a given order, okay? TT bar inclusive, mass of the top, yes. Yeah, but if you have like some uh, multi jet or whatever, what would be the scale? So, the, 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 there's again two questions. If you have one scale that dominates the others, that's usually the scale that you have. So, let me take an example I'll come back to later. Take measuring the Higgs, measuring inclusive Higgs, mass of the Higgs is okay. Or you're measuring the TT bar. Mass of the top is, in, is correct. Now you're measuring the PT of the top. If the PT of the top is much smaller than the mass of the top, then PT of the top is okay. If the PT of the top becomes much larger than the mass of the top, so you're measuring one or two TV tops in transverse momentum, then the PT of the top becomes a relevant scale. And so indeed, I, I assume here there's only one scale. When there are multiple scales, this choice can become a bit, more, a, a bit more delicate. Usually it's the hard scale in the process, but whenever you have a separate scale, you should also be worried about whether there are large logs between these two scales. So I'll slightly come back to that when I'll discuss resummations uh, later on. It depends on the cut, it depends on, so whenever, the, the rule of thumb, if all the scales are of the same order, then essentially whichever choice you're making should not matter and should be included inside your uncertainty band. If the scales become widely separate and you get large logs between the separate scales, you need to worry whether or not you should resum these scales. That's the, uh, again, that's, that's the rule of thumb for, but yeah, choosing a scale for multi-scale processes is, is not necessarily easy. Uh, and there's no real guiding principle, except saying if they're of the same order, you're fine, we should be fine, and if they're widely separate, worry about resummation. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the rule of thumb. So, the first part of today's lecture is essentially going to try and see how you can define jets in a, in a hadron collider context. And so just, uh, I'd like briefly to remind you what, what's the physics behind it. So imagine you have an event like this, Again, taking E plus E minus on PP, I don't care. Uh, everyone's going to tell me how many jets do I have here? Here. Here. Not quite sure, right? So it, what this is meant to remind you, going back to the discussion we had on Tuesday, is that 
Jets want are meant, you, you want to think that these are essentially two hard partons here, three hard partons there, and something like either two, or maybe, well, at least two on this side, and then maybe something, or, well, one or two there is a bit, is a bit less clear. And essentially, the fact that you're dominated by, flow of energy is dominated by collinear branchings, and so hard partons will branch into a few directions. Now, Collinear means has some degree of randomness, right? Something for someone, for a fraction of you, this is collinear enough that it's one jet. For another fraction, this is not collinear enough and this is two different jets, okay? Uh, and when, you, when we were doing this in E plus E minus, we had all these parameters like D cut for uh, successive, successive recombination algorithms. And depending on the, vari the value of D cut you're going to use, either this is going to be classified as two jets or this is going to be classified as, uh, sorry, three or four jets or even even two jets, if you take decode high enough, you're going to get just one jet on one side and one jet on the other. So, the, there are a few differences between what we did in E plus E minus and what we're going to do in PP. Uh, the first one is, is probably just a question of scope uh, or, or, or the motivation, if you wish. Uh, in E plus E minus, many of the JET studies were actually meant as studying QCD. So you, you, you do measure these JETs. There's a parameter, for example, and for a given value of a parameter, you can calculate in QCD the rate of two, three, four, five JET events and compare that to data. You can uh, calculate the rate, the, the rate of three JET events as vary when you vary d cut, compare that between theory and data, and from this you can at the same time study QCD, extract alpha S, do lots of interesting QCD studies. Uh, in proton-proton collisions, at least how it's used now uh, at the LHC, this is not the end of the story, right? You want to use jets for much more than this. Uh, I think that the vast majority of LHC analysis today use JET. Not all of these are pure QCD studies, okay? The LHC does something more, I hope you're aware of that, than studying QCD, all right? Uh, so this is really uh, going back to here, you really want to identify uh, hard partons. And then whichever study you want with this, okay? So what you want is really saying it, whether it's a, it's a, it's a SUSY search, a Technicolor search, I don't know, whatever, it's, it's a BSM search, a measurement, a Higgs measurement, a, a, a TT bar measurement, uh, whichever it is a search or an analysis, usually the final state you want, you're interested in involve hard partons somehow, and these hard partons are going to give you jet. Uh, conversely, even if, you're if your final state is purely leptonic or, uh, or missing, uh, missing energy coming from neutrino, usually you want to impose that there are no jets, and if there are no jets, you involve jets as well, because you impose them, they're none. Uh, so I in any case, this is mostly going back to the concept that a jet is meant to identify the hard objects in an event, and I'd like here to add, in a, in a safe way, because the concept of a parton is ill-defined, while the concept of a jet is supposed to be something you can calculate order by order in perturbation theory and get an answer, okay? Depending on the thing you use, you're going to get three and four or four jets, but at least if I start adding some extra particles in here, I will get something that I can compute in QCD, while the number of partons is not something that you can compute in QCD, uh, which, which is ill-defined. So the, the, the recipe in that case is always going to be, I have a list of partons. I'm going to run that through a jet algorithm or a jet definition. And this is going to give me a list of jets, okay? And I want to choose this in a way that I get a fairly good approximation of what I mean when, when you talk to uh, 
some, I don't know, model builder that tells me, ah, you think about, I don't know, I have a process that should decay, a BSM particle that should decay into a pair of quarks plus two new leptons, I don't know, anything you want. Uh, naturally, I have a pair of quarks, so I should expect to see two jets in the final state. Okay, This is this presumption, this concept that goes underneath here. And the jet, by that jet jet definition here, I mean two things. First, the algorithm, and two, the parameters. And if you want to specify going from here to here in a well-defined way, you need to specify at the same time the recipe you've used, I've used the JET algorithm to get the jets in this event. And you need to specify the parameter. You need to specify which D cut you've used to get your, your, your result. If you're just telling you, I'm using the JET algorithm, there's no way. If you're just telling someone else, I've used the JET algorithm to cluster my jets, that person will not be able to reproduce your results because until they know exactly what parameter you've used. So uh, going from here to here in a well-defined way imposes both to know the algorithm and the parameters. So, what changes when you go to plus and minus to proton-proton collision? What are the main things that become different? Say that again? That's one. Initial state effects is actually the second one I wanted to mention. But So, initial state effects may not be the uh, most problematic one in the sense that most in a broad sense, either initial state is purely collinear to the beam and I don't really care, or the minute initial state become, starts to give me hard partons, this is a fixed order correction, right? So that means that if, when, I, when I do compute, say, something like that, I'm going to compute E plus E minus to QQ bar gluon. If I want to compute three jets in the PP collisions, okay, fine. Th that gluon can be radiated from everything, but it still goes into my sigma hat up there, the, 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 the leading contribution still goes into my sigma hat up there. It just means that the Feynman graph that I need to compute this involves also radiation from, from the initial state or involves more color particles in the, whole, in the whole process. So the calculation is more complicated. But initial state itself is not too much of an effect. On the other hand, uh, what is an effect is the fact that I'm still having all these soft non-perturbative interactions, which I've called the underlying event or MPI uh, yesterday, and these things are going to, so the fact that the incoming particles are charged under, under, under QCD is actually something that's actually going to create lots of extra activity in the detector, and so this means that if you think about this, it's going to add things a little bit, a little bit everywhere, and so now if I'm trying to split this event into three jets, so one jet here, one jet there, and what gen there, as I did with the, uh, with the Jade algorithm, remember, I was just breaking the event into patches with Jade. Uh, if, if I'm trying to break this event into three patches, each of these three patches is going to be significantly affected by, so imagine I break the whole LHC detector into just two guys. This is going to capture all the activity, all the soft activity from the underlying events, and this is going to give me a huge energy resolution bias or a huge energy resolution issue in, the, uh, in my jets. So the, the, what I'm telling you here is the energy I'm going to capture in my jet is not only the energy of the hard particles I want to measure, it's also going to be contaminated by all the extra activity that comes from all the rest of the event, which is soft and which I don't want in a way, because they're not exactly part of what I mean by my initial hard partons, okay? So, uh, yep, wrong column. Uh, and so typically what this means is that what you want to do is actually limit the size of your jet. So you want to say, instead of breaking my, my event into this but it's really becoming a mess. Uh, instead of breaking my event into, uh, into big patches, I want to limit the reach, limit, uh, the reach of jets. And this is sometimes, well, th this, this is done by introducing a jet radius, which is something you've probably heard about if you heard about jets at the LHC, but I haven't introduced when I was discussing jets in, in 
e plus e minus. In a way, it's a little bit the same idea as the delta parameter of Sturman and Weinberg, which is going to tell you, in, I don't want to just break the whole event. I just want to look er, not too far away around the directions of the initial hard guys, so I don't get too much contamination from all these, uh, from all these extra soft activity. There's another practical change. Okay, I can give you a reference. Uh, yeah, uh, I I won't talk about pileup unless unless you really insist. Uh, I spent a fraction of last year writing a 250 pages long document on pileup. I can send you the reference if you insist. I won't concentrate that into 10 minutes. Uh, Much more practical. What's the difference? Something we discussed yesterday. What's the difference, practical difference, between what you do in a PP collision and what you, we had done in an, er, in an E plus and minus collision? You don't know square root of s, that's one. And what was the consequence of, having, of not knowing square root of s? We use other variables. I told you it was something simple. In this case, we were using momentum directions, say angles and energies. In this case, you want to use PT, rapidity, ay, 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 rapidity, and, and phi. All right? So we'll need to adjust to the fact that uh, our algorithm needs to be long, invariant along uh, longitudinal boosts. So there's essentially. A, all I said on Tuesday about jets in E plus E minus can more or less be carried on straightforwardly to jets in PP. The first thing is uh, the, there are two, the same two big families of jet definitions you can use. The first one being the cone algorithm. So many people say, I'm using the cone algorithm. I will not speak a lot about this. The third thing I'd like is to insist of is that there's more than one. So the Tevatron used this for most of their studies. They used a version of the cone. Uh, it's based, so th the differences between uh, this and the other family is pairwise successive recombinations. The main difference is, is conceptual, right? This works by saying, I want to go back in time in the soft and collinear branchings that have created my jet. So it's really trying to go backwards the, through the part and shower. Uh, this is really trying to say, jets are actually direction, the main directions in which my energy flow in the event. Okay, so remember, one was really trying to identify directions where energy was flowing, cones in which you could capture the energy. The other one was really going backwards until you find a, little, a few little directions, okay? So this is the main conceptual directions. Both are physically okay, but they, implement, they are implemented in a different way. So I, I don't want to go into details. Usually the, the, this flow of energy is implemented via something that people call a stable cone. Uh, which is where a cone comes in. There's, so when I say the cone algorithm has been used mostly at the Tevatron, there's at least uh, four incarnations of it. Uh, this goes under the name of Jet Clue, CDF Midpoint, or Jet Clue or Midpoint. Midpoint has one implementation in CDF, two implementations in D0, depending on the run. Uh, the one thing I'd like you to remember, if any of you sometimes read uh, all Tevatron papers, all the cones used at the Tevatron, including the cones, that, so when people move from the Tevatron to the LHC, they had used the cone at the Tevatron, they say, let's carry on using the cone at the LHC, okay? So there's one was Atlas cone, and one CMS iterative cone. All the six names I just gave you are all infrared or collinear unsafe at some order of the perturbation theory. Uh, there's, this is actually how I got into this business. Uh, th there's one and only one infrared and collinear safe cone known today, which is called Cisco. 
All the other ones which have been used in practice at, at the Tevatron and LHC are infrared or Corinne are unsafe. And uh, in the list of references I sent you, there's actually a long discussion about this. Both in the, uh, so the, the, the first lecture note I give in the references are actually discuss this in detail. And the uh, reference called Towards Jetography by Gavin Salam also discusses this in details. We were actually uh, working on this ourselves 10 years ago. Uh, Pairwise successive recombinations. Same thing as E plus E minus. You'll start with the KT algorithm, where you are going to define a distance between any pair of particles. I'll told you I want to change my variables, so now this is going to become the minimum of PTI squared instead of energy squared. I'm taking the minimum of PTI squared, PTJ squared. And instead of taking angles in the form of 1 minus cos theta ij, I'm going to use delta rij, which is with this become being delta y ij squared plus delta phi ij squared. OK? Then you proceed the same way as before, all right? You just say, I'm going to identify the minimum, the pair that minimizes this distance, and I'm going to recombine the two objects into a single one, removing, replacing the two old objects, i and j, by their sum, and iterate that procedure. The one thing that changes compared to, uh, to e plus e minus is related to this, and is the stopping criterion. In E plus E minus, we were clustering this until we reach some D cut or Y cut overall scale, breaking all the particles in the event into a bunch of directions, okay? In this case, what we're going to do is introduce a second scale, which only depends on a single particle, all right? And that single scale is just going to be PTI squared times some number R squared. And this is something called the inclusive inclusive version of the algorithm, while the plus and minus version was called the exclusive version. Exclusive essentially means you break the whole event into jets. This means we just include a few. Uh, we, we're just going to include a few of them. Uh, R is the parameter that I was mentioning before, that's the jet radius. How is this achieving what we want, okay? Typically, well, first of all, there's something I didn't tell you. You go, now, instead of computing the minimum distances between the dij, you're going to compute the minimum between all the dijs and the dib. So all pairwise plus all single particle, the b stands for beam distances. I won't get into uh, historical reasons for this. Uh, if the minimum, is the ij, I recombine i and j into i plus j. If min is the ib, I say i is a jet. I, say, I, call, I call object i a jet and I remove it from what I have, I'm left to cluster. How does this work? Well, you can understand this typically. When is, going, when is the minimum going to be a DIB? The min minimum is typically going to, DI, to be a DIB when this distance, this distance, the ge this geometrical distance here becomes larger than R. Okay? These prefactors are typically sharing common scales, but when this distance here is going to be larger than R, this m distance here is going to become a bit smaller than this distance there. Okay? So the parameter R here really controls the geometrical extent of your jets. All right? Uh, now, is this collinear safe? If I break one particle into two collinear particles, okay, this is just going to be, this distance is small. These two objects are going to be recombined 
from line zero, okay, from step zero. So this is collinear safe. Is this infrared safe? So again, you want to check it's infrared safe. Imagine I just have an event with two particles in the event, that's the beam, and I'm adding a soft particle somewhere in the event. Is the number of jets going to change after adding the soft particle or not? Yes? No? Maybe. Why maybe? <laughs> maybe is, yeah, I can, go, I can go with maybe. It depends. Remember, well, try to do the clustering with this, okay? What happens if you try to do the clustering here? You're going to compute all the IJs. There's only three of them. So this is one, two, and three. There's D12. D12 is large, okay? D13 is potentially small because there's a small PTI here. Uh, D23 is also potentially small because there's a, there's a small PTI in here. P3 is small in here. Uh, then there's all the beam distances. But among the beam distances, obviously, the smallest one is going to be PT3 squared R squared, all right? So the smallest distance here is going to be D3B. Uh, and then whether the minimum is DIB or DIJ depends on whether the angular distances between 1, 3, and 2, 3 is bigger or smaller than R. Okay? If this distance here is bigger than R, then the minimum distance is going to be DIB here. The minimum here is going to be PT3 squared delta R13 squared. This is going PT3 squared R squared. The minimum depends on whether delta R13 is bigger or smaller than R squared. So if this angle here, this distance here in, in that sense becomes large, so if I emit a soft gluon at large angle, this gluon is just going to go in its own jet. So this is going to give you three jets. While if this gluon was not there, I would only have two jets, okay? So per se, if I just tell you this, the number of jets is not an infrared safe quantity. So what is going to trivially save the day? Is there a way to get rid of this guy? There's an easy way to get rid of this guy. Has anyone here ever opened a paper with an LHC analysis or something related to an LHC analysis, a theory paper related to an LHC analysis, where they were using jets? No one? Really? Yes, okay. What were they imposing on their jets? Cuts. What kind of cuts? PD cut. If you do impose a PT cut, saying my jet needs to have a sufficiently high PT, then this infinitely soft guy, yeah, it's going to be clustered. The procedure there is going to give you one jet with it, but you won't include it in your list of jets above a certain PT cut. The list of jets above a certain PT cut is just going to be these two hard guys, and so the list of jets above a certain PT cut is both infrared and collinear safe. So. This procedure is infrared and collinear safe if, you, if your goal is to look at the hard objects inside, inside the event. All right? Uh, there's one other thing, which is there are alternative options. In principle, there's something called the Cambridge Aachen uh, mostly because it was both introduced by these two differences. Oh, actually, you can have a version of it in E plus E minus. I didn't speak about it. Where you're going to define dij, which is delta r ij squared, and dib, which is r squared. This is the simplest thing you can dream of, right? It's just a geometric clustering. You don't care about whether particles are hard or soft, you just cluster them, you cluster things which are nearby. Uh, as long as you have this factor here, it's collinear safe, and as long as you put a PT cut, it's, it's uh, infrared safe. So this is as well infrared and collinear safe. Uh, you can push it uh, 
by saying, I'm actually going to do the opposite. And so instead of making a, a weight which favors the clustering of soft particles like Katie was doing for a right purpose in E plus E minus, I'm going to push it and say, no, I'm actually going to favor the clustering of hard particles first. So again, if you have a particle with a high PT, it gets a small distance, and I want to cluster the hard particles first. Uh, this is the NTKT algorithm. Have you heard? Who here has heard about it before? The reason why, who here had heard about KT before? Okay, about the same. Uh, one of the reasons, maybe, is because NTKT is the one which is used as GLHT now. So I would say 99% of jet clustering at the LHC, all standard clustering at the LHC is done with the NTKT algorithm. A small fraction uses, I'd say, mostly Cambridge because, well, some jet substructure studies use Cambridge because Cambridge is ordered in angles and that's nice and, uh, nice and smooth. Some even re more remote uh, jet substructure studies can use KT, can use also other differences, more generalized versions of KT, but mostly, this you should remember, uh, keeping somewhere remote in your head that there are other alternatives like this one which are used at the LHC. Question, why do you want to use this instead of the other two? Imagine now I have one hard part as I had here, okay? Typical thing like that. I have a, a real hard guy somewhere here. What's going to happen with this real hard guy? This guy is hard. It has a small distances, okay? So among all the distances, the pairwise distances I can build, the smallest one is going to be between this hard guy and either some softer guy around or a beam distance, okay? So I have to compare my PT hard minus two times a distance with a neighbor or PT hard minus two times R squared. The smallest distance is going to be PT hard minus two to the nearest neighbor, okay? So what this is going to do is take the nearest particle to that hard guy, cluster it together with the hard guy. Then take the next nearest, cluster it with the hard guy. And so starting from the hard guy, you're going to start aggregating nearest guys until you've reached a distance r, at which stage this becomes the smallest distance, and you're going to say this is a jet. So the, the benchmark property of this guy is that it's actually achieving an almost perfect code. So people at the Tevatron who are used to use the code for many reasons, I don't want to discuss, to, to really enter into this. Actually, this was uh, nice replacement because it's essentially achieving the same nice properties of having the cone that you love that the Tevatron. In particular, one uh, practical aspect is that since the jet have a genuine boundary, a, a well-defined shape, they're actually easier to understand from a detector point of view. They're easier to calibrate. Easier to tell you from the energy deposits I see, this is the real energy of my jet or the real PT of my jet compared to other cases where if the boundaries are fuzzy, things start to depend more on soft physics and things are more, more complicated. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is all these guys were not introduced by mistake, right? At the end of the day, you could think of hundreds or maybe thousands of recipes to say, I'm going to go from particles to jet. Uh, there's a list of constraints that you want to satisfy. Uh, one should be obvious to all of you. What do you want your jet definition? Can I take my jet definition to be anything I want? Obviously, no. I cannot say every single part in my event is a jet because I can. I can say all the particles in my event are different jets. This is well-defined. The LHC sees an event, it sees particles, uh, putting aside detector granularities and things like that. Every single particle is a, is a jet. How is that wrong for all of you? It is a definition. Every particle is a jet. End of story. That's a definition. No parameters, it's a definition.
That's a definition. I mean, I can live with that. Well, I cannot live with that, but why, can I, can, why can't I live with that? It's not safe. I told you, if you want to apply this, uh, if an experimentalist wants to say every single particle is a jet, good luck calculating that. Right? So you want something which is IRC safe. Uh, you want something also uh, that an experimentalist can do. Okay? So you want something which is well defined based on particles. If you say, I call every glue on the jet, uh, good luck implementing that in the real detector. Uh, also, one thing which is highly non-trivial, and that was part of this whole discussion also, is the fact that uh, a perturbative calculation has, what, a handful of partons? Ten at most, okay? Uh, that's easy to handle. You can almost do it analytically. Uh, if you do cluster an event at the LHC, including pileup, as you were mentioning earlier, there's thousands of particles in your event, hundreds even at low pileup. So the, a final state has hundreds of particles. Uh, you cannot, you, for a few particles, you can actually proceed through this clustering by hand. For hundreds of particles, good luck doing this by hand. Even numerically, you need a fast method to be able to extract the jets numerically. There's actually, I was speaking about Cisco and earlier, there's actually another uh, possible alternative which would take typically, the naive alternative you could do to get something which is infrared and linear safe would take more than the age of the universe to cluster 20 particles. Uh, that's not something that an ex any experimentalist would agree to do, right? Because you have hundreds of particles and you don't want to wait for the age of the universe to tell you whether you reject one supersymmetric model up to 100 GV, or one TV, I don't know. You're not, probably not willing to wait for uh, more than the lifetime of any of the PhDs here to do so. Uh, so you want something which is essentially fast uh, or practical, experimentally speaking. And you also want something for which if you talk to an experimentalist or if you talk to a guy who's doing what's at the top there, uh, they're talking more or less about the same thing, right? And so this means that if I'm trying to get the jet into some basic event, potentially a basic perturbative event with just a few QCD orders corrections, or if you talk to the same guy which is going to include part and shower, including initial stage shower, including whatever you want in this case, or if you, talk, if you look at the same event, including hadronization and non perturbative corrections, where you would also have, see from these guys, branchings and everything, you would also see pions and kaons coming out, so real hadrons instead of, instead of this, including hadronization and underlying event. Or if you talk to an experimentalist which sees this through a detector, at the end of the day, you want this picture to be coherent across all these things. Because if what you observe in a detector for a given event is completely different from what you started with in, in, in your uh, theoretical picture, uh, that purpose of identifying hard partons is, is lost, okay? So you want something which at the end of the day gets coherent across all these views of an event, which means is not too sensitive to details of soft physics, for example. So not too sensitive to the underlying event, not too sensitive to detector effects, and that's where having something which is perfectly circular helps compared to other things which are more sensitive to, uh, to, to the soft. The minute the boundary of your jet start depending on soft radiation, you gain an extra degree of sensitivity between going to what you think you have in the first place to what you really see at the end, okay? So these, these are really the main criterion you want for, your jet, for this recipe, and this is essentially why NTKT was, was chosen. Uh, there's actually, in terms of implementation, there's, uh, I mentioned Pythia and, and Herwig yesterday as computer codes and MadGraph as computer codes to, uh, to generate these events. Uh, if you want a computer code to do this for you, there's something called FastJet, which allows you to get this in uh, milliseconds for any event you want. Questions? It will, it will, so if you have, I don't know, if you have two guys which are, 
Yeah, if you have two guys, so one guy here, one guy there, the distance here is, is say, uh, 1.5 times r, okay? If you add something in the middle, the shape of your jet is not going to be exactly this, it's going to be something like, well, if one is much harder than the other, then one is going to be circular, the other one is going to be what's left. If they share the exact uh, energy, then what you're going to get is something which is equally split between the two. Right. Uh, in a way, this is a requirement of infrared corner safety. You cannot, well, you can push it. You can push it to the point where if this is epsilon harder than this one, you keep getting something, something circular uh, with, with cone algorithms, but that's the best you can do. I, in a way, I think that the, uh, this question of what happens when you have hard object nearby is actually related to the question of infrared corner safety. And this, this is a, so a small price to pay to get guaranteed infrared corner safety keeping all the nice properties of recombination algorithms. Recombination algorithms are e easier to deal with in QCD. They have, uh, th they're fast. Uh, their implementation here uh, doesn't really apply. It's, uh, clustering with Cisco is not nearly as fast as, uh, as clustering with NTKT, KT, or Cambridge. Uh, so there's, there's lots of extra, uh, of extra properties. If you don't like this, this is actually a small price to pay. Uh, in practice, it's actually probably better to have it than not. Any questions about jets? Because I'm about to move to something completely different. Yes? It's not suited for substructure studies because substructure studies try to look at inside the jet at various scales in the jet. And for that, you want something that is sensitive to different scales in the jet in a, more, in a way which, which respects QCD better. And the way which respects QCD better is a way which captures in a better way collinear and soft physics. And in that case, you'd naturally do for, go with KT and Cambridge. Naturally, you'd go with KT, which has both soft and collinear. Uh, in practice, you tend to go with Cambridge because of something known as angular ordering, and I'll go back to that in, in 10 minutes, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, so for substructure studies, there are reasons to, 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 to be willing to go into different things. But these things are essentially related to what happens inside a jet, so they're located in space, if you wish. And so they're not really uh, directly concerned by, by having these, uh, deciding what the boundaries of the jet are. So the, the scope is slightly different. But in terms of, say, generic jet properties, there's, there's no real uh, drawback that I'm aware of. Uh, this actually might be the, in, in terms of calibrating things in, a, in a, an experimental context, this fact that when two jets become nearby, the, the boundary is not exactly the same, so calibration should slightly change, is, is one of the things you have to worry about. Uh, but that's about, uh, that's about it. Uh, anything else? All right, so with a lot of delay, or I'm going to what I promised I would do, which is uh, all order calculations. The question is why? Why or when, I guess? And as I was mentioning earlier, the rule of thumb is QCD is a logarithmically divergent theory, at least in the infrared. Let's not talk about the UV for the moment. Or let's not talk about the UV except saying that it goes into the running of the coupling and then I'm done with it. Uh, so whenever you have two scales, You should expect log of ratios of these scales. These scales may be either dimensionful or dimensionless. Imagine, I don't know, typically an angular scale. Imagine I'm sensitive to angles to two different angular scales in, the, in, the, in, in a process. I'm going to get logs of theta 2 or theta 1. 
And if you're sensitive to both different energy scales and different angular scales, you're going to get two logs associated, one with the soft emission, one with the collinear divergence. So essentially a log which is at the same time soft and collinear will be sensitive to both differences, large differences in energies and large differences in angles. So you have to worry. So the perturbation theory is going to give you terms which are alpha s times the log, or potentially if you have both alpha s times the log squared. And the minute these logs become large, you essentially worried that what you thought was a series expansion in terms of alpha s is no longer really a series expansion because typically series expansion, you hope that when you compute one order higher, you get something which converges compared to the previous order. And obviously, if these logs become large, this is no longer the case, okay? Uh, we saw examples on Monday and Tuesday the thrust distribution, if you go with thrust close to one, or uh, jade or uh, T jets uh, at LEP, if you take Y cut to be small, you start getting logs of Y cut or logs of minus first. Okay? This is mostly because you're getting close to a region where the two scales in your problem, which were S and Y cut times S, were becoming widely different, or your angular scales, which were essentially some number, some angle of order uh, of order pi, the whole scale of the det detector, uh, becomes of, uh, becomes widely different from an angle of order y cut, okay, or an angle square of order y cut. So you had a log square because you were when you take y cut to be small, you start getting sensitive to angles which are a factor of y cut smaller than the typical pi angle of your detector, and scales which are y cut lower than the typical square root of s scale or s scale of your, of your, of your process. So there's many cases where there are many ways to obtain uh, different scales, right? Uh, th there's a few typical cases. Let me, th there's one I already mentioned in the past. Imagine you want to measure the PT of the Higgs. So I want to measure the distribution to normalize of the PT of the Higgs. If the PT of the Higgs is large, fine. I'm sensitive to scales of order of the PT of the Higgs. Maybe if the PT of the Higgs becomes much larger than the mass of the Higgs, you, th you think I can start become, becoming worried about logs of the PT of the Higgs divided by the mass of the Higgs. Uh, the reason that the, 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 I don't want to talk about this, the one thing I'd like to talk about is what if the PT of the Higgs becomes soft? You know that typically leading order thing is via a top loop you're going to produce a Higgs via gluon gluon fusion. Uh, that has zero PT for the Higgs, so at leading order, there's nothing here. If now you want to get some PT for the Higgs, you need to add an extra particle somewhere. Okay? So if this particle is hard, mass of the Higgs are higher, then you get a high PT because essentially what you're going to get is gluon gluon going to Higgs on one side and recoiling gluon on the opposite side. So you essentially get the PT of the Higgs recoiling against the PT of this gluon. But if the PT of the Higgs becomes small, it means that the recoiling PT of the gluon becomes small. And obviously, this is a soft divergence. You hit the region where you have to consider soft gluons. So if you look at this in the fixed order perturbation theory, you get something that blows up. So if you want to start being worried about what's the PT distribution of the Higgs at small PT, this is something that fixed order perturbation theory is not going to give you, all right? Uh, other cases involve uh, jet vetoes. Imagine you want die jets. You have something that tells you, I should have just two jets in the event, nothing more. You're going to say, I want, say, two jets with PT bigger than a high scale, say 1 TV, and then I want no other jets with PT, so two jets with this, and no jets with PT bigger than some scale Q2. Uh, let me give you a practical example of this. Imagine you want to disentangle Higgs production via gluon-gluon fusion from Higgs via vector boson, WW for example going to Higgs, going to something. Typically, 
glue glue to Higgs is going to radiate extra gluons because the gluons are going to radiate, that's, that's what they do. But if you do vector boson going to Higgs, there's actually much less QCD activity because Ws don't radiate gluons that easily, right? Uh, so this means that you, if you want to say, I want an enriched sample of vector boson fusion Higgs, I can say, well, I want a very little hadronic activity beside my Higgs, and so I want that I have no jets above a certain region above a certain PD cut. So you're going to say, typically, I want, uh, I want no jets above 20 GV. So this now means that you have two scales in the problem. You have the mass of the Higgs, and you have your PT veto. And if your PT veto, say 20 GV, becomes much smaller than the mass of the Higgs, you should expect log of PT veto over, PT, over mass Higgs. If you take PTV is small enough, which is what usually 20 GV is small enough in this case, maybe 30 GV is small enough, you're going to get things like that, which mean that strict fixed order perturbation theory starts to become less and less predictive, okay? There's other probably more complicated cases. Uh, actually, one, there's several of them. I had a list here. Let me make sure I... Yeah, jet vetoes was one of them. Uh, there's two other cases, and actually one is the one I'm going to take uh, for the rest of the, of the time because it's, uh, because it's actually going to be easier to discuss. One, sometimes logs can be hidden. Imagine I'm doing a collision between two guys, and I want to measure what happens if I produce a heavy guy. So Higgs here, all right? There's going to be a region where my hadronic, sorry, my, my partonic center of mass energy, S hat, which is x1, x2 times the PP center of mass of the collision, there's a region where this is of order of the mass of the particle you want to produce. So if you want to produce a Higgs like here, there's going to be a region where essentially you do have the two gluons which are exactly conspiring so that the center of mass of the collision is at the mass of the Higgs, okay? Now, if you start having small soft gluon corrections to this or small collinear gluon emissions to this, X1 and X2 are going to slightly vary, and so this relation means that you're going to start deviating from the exact case where S hat is of, is of the order of Mx. So if you want to impose something like that, at some point you should expect that in the region where this, this S hat becomes very close to the mass of the Higgs, you do get logs of S hat over the mass of the Higgs squared, or the mass of whatever object you produce, uh, essentially in that case, collinear logs, because they're logs related to the fact that X1 and X2 can actually be slightly larger than the X1, X2 to get exactly at threshold, and, and you read the collinear gluon, which actually brings you back to threshold. So in practice, there's a question, do you worry about this? Because at the end of the day, S hat is not what you observe. S hat comes inside this expression here, and I do integrate over an X1 and X2, so this potentially, with the, I, I, I will get a log inside sigma hat, but that log is going to be smeared and finite at the end of the day if I integrate over the PDFs. Fine. Uh, so what you do in that case, you sit down, you do the calculation, and you check whether it has an impact or not. In practice, it, it can have an impact of several percent in a way that this does have a meaningful impact on the precision you're trying to achieve in some cases. So these are called threshold algorithms. And so what, what I'm mentioning this for is essentially that they can be hidden. It's not something, so S hat is an internal scale inside your integration. So that even though there's only one scale in the problem here, sometimes that one scale can have hidden logarithms because sometimes in your phase space you do get close to regions where, where you can have logs. They may be important, they may not be important. That's what it is. Uh, the one case I'm actually going to discuss is, uh, is related to jet physics and I'm going to discuss this for mostly two reasons. The first one is because it's easier. 
And the second one is because I have notes on this. Uh, so that's something I'm used to do. And I can, is, well, the main reason actually is it's because it's simple. And since it's simple, we can actually do simple calculations and try to discuss what happens if you do something else later. Uh, so the one calculation I'm going to do is look at a jet and try to measure the mass of the jet. A jet is made of several particles. It has a mass, okay? Uh, you may think a jet is a quark or a gluon. If you go back to the uh, zeroth order concept, a, quark is a, a, a jet is a quark or a gluon. Quarks and gluons don't have mass, what you're talking about. Well, uh, by the fact that they emit quarks and further, they branch into further quarks and gluons, they pick up some virtuality, and if they pick up some virtuality, they pick up some mass, okay? So in practice, uh, a jet is an ensemble of particles, and because it's an ensemble of particles, it's not a zero mass object, all right? So I actually want to, so in that case, we have two scales, right? You have the mass of the jet and the PT of the jet. So I want to focus on the region where What's the region you should be worried about in this case if you're doing fixed order perturbation theory? If the mass becomes much smaller than the PT of the jet, you might be worried that there are some logarithms of the ratio, okay? So I'm going to show you that explicitly uh, let's see where this gets us. So how do you get the mass of a jet? You start doing as, start going to here, right? So first thing I'm going to do is I'm assuming I'm having a jet. I'm going either to use energies or PT. Energy may be easier because I can use energies and angles. Uh, replace this by PT and, and delta and delta R's. The, this, this, the calculation goes from one to the other and, and back. It's, it, there's absolutely zero difference for what I'm going to do today. Uh, the, I'll actually highlight differences maybe at the very end. Uh, how do you pick a mass? So zeroth order QCD, a jet, is one parton. That's alpha s to the zero in this case, all right? That's the zeroth order, leading order QCD, a jet is one parton. What's the mass here? Massless to zero. Okay, quarks are massless to zero. A quark or a gluon, I don't care. I'll, I'll take the case of a quark for, for uh, uh, illustrative purpose. You can do the same calculation with gluons. So how do you get a mass? You go to the first correction in alpha s. First correction in alpha s, that can emit a gluon, all right? It emits a gluon carrying a fraction z of the energy. So the energy, if this has an energy e, it's z times e. This is 1 minus z times e. And there's an angle theta at which it is emitted, all right? Uh, in principle, you can work out the whole thing. Uh, again, I want to do something simple, and everything which is not simple, I'm going to come back to it at the end of the day, hopefully. Uh, so I'm going to assume the jet has a given radius, and I'm just going to assume that r is small. I'm taking r small enough so that I can neglect higher power corrections in the, in, in, in the jet radius. And the main reason that... Uh, I'm doing that is because if R is small, I can focus on only collinear emissions, okay? If you start taking R, which is large, you'll have to worry about uh, soft but non-collinear emissions. I'll come back to that. At the moment, let me assume I'm only looking in a narrow, in a narrow region of phase space, so small R. In that case, I'm going for the moment to make the approximation that all the physics is collinear. So if all the physics is collinear, I'm going to get a contribution from collinear gluon emissions here, all right? Actually, you do get two contributions at this order of the perturbation theory. You do get this, and you do get virtual corrections. Remember, if I want to get something finite, I need both. So instead of calculating the distribution of mass, it's actually more illustrative to calculate something I'm going to call sigma of m which is the probability that the, mass is, that, that the mass of the jet is smaller than m, 
And actually, it's m squared and mass squared is more than m squared. Uh, so I'm, instead of computing the distribution in mass, I'm computing the integrated distribution in mass from zero to some value m squared, okay? Uh, and, and the reason for that is going to become apparent in, in fairly soon. So this will get, at order alpha s, this, I, what I will get, let me try maybe to come back here, sigma of m squared is, so leading order of the perturbation theory, what's the value of the mass? Here, just one quark. Mass is zero. So if I ask that the mass is smaller than something, I'm going to take that something non-zero, so at least mass is bigger than zero. Uh, leading, order of, leading order of perturbation theory, I'm getting one. Systematically, my mass is smaller than m squared, okay? I'm getting zero, zero smaller. Uh, higher order corrections. We know, and I refer back to what I did on Tuesday, that I'll have to integrate over some angle, over some energy momentum fraction here, P of Z with the uh, splitting function, P of Z here being CF times one plus one minus Z squared over Z. That's what we did on Tuesday, if you remember, or Monday, Tuesday. That's my phase space integration, alpha s over two pi, so this is an alpha s correction. And then I do need two contributions. There's the first contribution, which is the real emissions as we discussed, as we discussed on Monday. And in that case, I need to check what's the mass of my jet. If I have a system like that, what's the mass of the jet I'm going to get out of this? All right? So I'll probably see something somewhere so I can make all sorts of detailed calculations somewhere else. So the mass of the jet, let me call this uh, P and call this K. The mass of the jet is M squared is P plus K squared, which is two P dot K, which is two times the energy of the jet times Z times one minus Z times one minus cosine theta being the angle between the two, which in the approximation where theta is small is about e squared times z, one minus z, theta squared. Scalar product, we did that in the past, all right? So I need to impose that e squared z, one minus z, theta squared, is smaller than m squared if I want the mass of the jet to be smaller than m squared. Is that the only constraint I need here? If I ask a question, you should suspect that the answer is no. So let me directly move to the next question. What should I add or multiply in this case? Is this really the mass of my jet if I have a gluon emitted at an angle theta and with a fraction of energy z. Sorry? Uh, it is in there. The one minus z is handling this. Uh, if you wish, there's a question whether this guy slightly recoils here, and theta is the, is the angle there. So this is, if, if theta is the angle between p and k, this formula is exact. There's no energy momentum conservation in here. What is my jet with this system? What is the jet here with this quark gluon system? What is it, what is it made of? Quark? And gluon? Is the gluon in the jet or is it somewhere out? I told you, go back to the recipe up there. If the, for the gluon to be inside the jet, it needs to be at a distance smaller than R compared to the quark here. If it's a distance bigger than R, that, that's actually going to give me two jets, not one jet. So if I want this gluon to be in the jet, I need to have theta smaller than R. What if theta is bigger than R? If theta is bigger than R, my jet is only made of one quark, and so the mass of the jet is zero. 
So theta, if, if it's outside, the constraint on the mass is actually nothing. Then virtual corrections. There's one thing I completely failed to tell you in the past, and that actually bothered me for some time, which is uh, we derived this expression for real emissions, right? It comes straight out of the e plus e minus to q bar gluon case. It's actually more generic, but uh, we derive this expression in a way. Uh, what's the form of virtual corrections, right? In principle, for virtual corrections, you'll need to integrate over all possible gluons here. I need to integrate all possible gluons as an internal loop integration, and that internal loop integration is supposed to cancel potential divergences I have from here. Do I have divergences here? Of course I do. If I take theta going to zero here, if I take theta going to zero, this goes to zero. So this means that if theta becomes small enough, every single jet I'm going to get has a value of the mass smaller than m squared, and so there's nothing here that prevents me from hitting the collinear divergences at theta equals zero. So this result so far, real contribution to these results are infinite. So I do need to cancel them against some virtual corrections, which in principle will be a complicated infinite integration that at the end of the day, for which the mass is zero, that will cancel against this. Now, the minute you know that all collinear divergence have to cancel, it needs to be finite, right? There's only one way of achieving this, is if I can write down the virtual correction with exactly the same functional dependence. So in the collinear limit, I know that the one over theta squared correction has to cancel exactly the one over theta squared correction from real emissions. So this means that I can actually write down the virtual correction exactly under this form, an integration d theta squared over theta squared with a weight, which is an integration between 0 and 1 over z. I know it has, there's only one possibility. It has to have exactly the same expression, integration between 0 and something over theta squared, integration between 0 and 1 dz over z. That's the only way I can exactly make sure that they cancel. So this means that virtual correction can go directly straight, straightly, straightforwardly be written here with a minus sign because I need to cancel the plus sign here. And so the only thing I'm left with is what's the size of, what's the value of the mass for this kind of jets? Zero. So I get a minus theta of zero smaller than m squared. Do I need to put any constraint on theta being or not being inside the jet? No. I mean, this, this, formal integration with theta, that's an internal integration which has nothing to do with whatever final particle produced in the final state. So the final state doesn't know nothing about this internal theta. And so whatever value of theta I'm taking in this expression, uh, I'm always going to get just one particle in the final state. So the particle is this, whichever the, the value is zero, whichever the value of theta. All right. So let's try to get this. Uh, the first thing, I apologize, I... Uh, if we want to be done in half an hour, I'll have to get something simple. Uh, theta of zero smaller than m squared, everyone agrees this is one? Theta zero smaller than m squared, I guess you still agree this is one. Uh, here, theta of theta bigger than r minus 1. I guess everyone here will agree that these two can be replaced by minus theta of theta smaller than r. Right? It's, if you factor out the minus sign, it's y minus theta of something, it's theta of the opposite. No, uh, no big surprising thing here. So at the end of the day, what you get is 1. Uh, minus, let me factor out this minus sign, the integration from theta over theta squared. This integration is now bounded by r squared because I have this theta here, which is both in this term and in that surviving term there. An integration between 0 and 1 dz p of z, alpha s over 2 pi, theta and uh, t -t -t so the, this term here is going to give me a minus one with a minus sign that's a plus one, and this term here is giving me a minus e squared z one minus z smaller than m squared. So that's real contribution 
virtual contribution after factoring out this minus sign. And again, one minus theta is just theta of the opposite. So this is just theta of e squared z one minus z theta squared bigger than m squared. Uh, first of all, have you seen there the cancellation of soft and Grignard divergences? I can have, we've talked about collinear earlier, I, can, I do have a collinear divergence, a potential collinear divergence, especially when you write it down this way, when theta goes to zero. That's the collinear divergence. Can theta go to zero here? No. At some point, theta needs to satisfy this constraint, so theta needs to be large enough so that it satisfies this. So this constraint now has shielded this zero here. Uh, and again, this happened because when theta goes to zero, there's a cancellation between the real emissions here and the virtual emissions here, so that everything where this object is smaller than m squared cancels between real and virtuals. Same thing as we had in the past. Uh, the same arguments apply for the soft divergence. There's a one over z in the splitting function, which is, which is actually the, the emission of soft gluons in this case. If z becomes zero, this guy here becomes zero, the mass becomes zero as well, and so this is not a load in this expression because of the cut in the jet mass. So at the end of the day, this expression here is finite, all right? So I want to compute it. I want to compute it in the limit where the mass is much smaller than, than the energy. What do I expect, even though it's finite? I expect logs of E over M. So what I'm going to do is just try, forget about computing this exactly. The only thing I want is extract these logarithms. I don't care about the rest. I just want the, the dominant behavior when the mass is much smaller than the energy. So first of all, the integration over theta is trivial here. That's essentially integration. Theta has to be bigger than M squared over E squared Z1 minus Z. So that's an integration that can be done uh, that you know how to do probably yourself since 10 or 15 years. Uh, one minus alpha s over two pi, the integration between zero and one dz p of z times log of uh, what I do get is here is z one minus z, and I'm actually going to write this down as one minus z over rho, with rho, which is m squared r squared, sorry, m squared over e squared r squared. Uh, so I don't have to carry this ratio all over anyway. So it's, it's just a log, right? I'm integrating some one over theta squared between two values. It's a log. And again, I want to focus on the region where m is much smaller than e, so when rho is smaller than 1. It's easier to work with one dimensionless parameter here than with two dimensional parameters. Right, left with just this. Getting close to the answer, right? E of z is cf times 2 over z minus 2 plus z squared over z over 2. I've expanded this. Anything further I need to think of when I say this? What's the first thing you should, no, sorry, two, thing, two things you, can, you should think of here. I'm interested in the limit where I'm getting as many logs as I can, all right? Where do you see things which are not going to give me logs? There's two places. The simplest one is to realize that this expression is not correct, right? Uh, I've done this integration. To get this integration, I need to impose that I do have some phase space in theta, all right? If I do have some phase space in theta, it means that my lower bound, m squared over e squared z1 minus z, has to be smaller than R squared, otherwise there's no phase space for this gluon emission here, all right? And if you do this, it actually tells you that Z cannot be as small as you want. But this expression, as it is written here, diverges when Z goes to zero. If Z goes to zero, I get a DZ over Z. 
times log of z, I don't care. It's still dz over z, don't degrade down to zero, that diverges. We discussed not later than five minutes ago that this was, we were fine when z goes to zero. This comes from the fact that when I wrote this, I forgot to tell you this, All right? So this is a quadratic equation in z. Everyone can invert a quadratic expression in z. Uh, I'm not going to do it because you don't need to do it. I'm interested in logs, remember? So I, what happens when z comes close to 1? Nothing. z comes close to 1, I'm just going to say this, this is essentially imposing that z is somewhere between rho times 1 plus something of order rho, smaller than z, smaller than 1 minus something of order rho. That's what it's going to give you. So do I care in this integration about this 1 minor order rho and 1 plus order rho when I work in the limit where rho is small? No, this is just going to give me power corrections, no logs. So I can actually just say neg I'm neglecting the 1 minus z here because I'm working with soft gluons. I want logs, I want soft gluons. If I want soft gluons, I can neglect z compared to 1. So I can neglect z here and I can neglect 1 minus z, z in 1 minus z here as well and just integrate this between row and one. One thing, whenever you neglect something, I'm going to come back to this at the end and say what are the size of the corrections that you get. Uh, I'll do it in real time if I can. In this case, neglecting this usually just gives you power corrections in row. In some cases, it can actually give you a term with no logs, which are actually two logs dominant, two logs subleading compared to the dominant one. But in this case, this is in no orders of logs should I have to worry about this. This is really power corrections. It's really, if you expand this, this is really going to give you a correction, which is a power of rho. And powers of rho are way down the food chain if I'm just worried about logs. There's logs to any power, and after computing all the logs to any power you might dream of, you're going to get power corrections. So power corrections, forget about them in, in any kind of resummation. You can neglect them. Until you've calculated them and realized that they're big. Okay? Uh, but here... They're actually not. Uh, one down, one to go. I want the maximum number of logs. If you want the maximum number of logs, what can I do here? This doesn't matter. If I want the maximum logs of rho, I just need to take care about the 2 over z. Actually, that integration here, it's a stupid integration I hope everyone can do without opening Mathematica. Uh, this is one. Minus, I'm having a feeling I'm missing a factor of 2 somewhere, but, uh, oh yeah, factor of 2 is here. 2 cancels this one, minus alpha s cf over pi. And if you do the exact calculation, what is this integration here? You do get 1 half log squared 1 over rho minus 3 quarters log 1 over rho. So I told you, if I take rho small, you should have expected this result from not doing the calculation. I take something small, the minute I'm taking a small mass, if I'm taking my mass in this expression to be small, I'm starting to get sensitive to a region where theta is small and to a region where z is small. This means I should expect soft logarithms and I should expect linear logarithms. And indeed, I do have a region which contributes for a log square coming from the region where z becomes of order rho and rho is small and from the region where theta becomes of order rho also in this, in this expression. Okay? So this is the result you should expect. Meaning, if I try to look at what happens when rho is small, things blow up. And this is not a predictive answer, a predictive result of perturbation theory in the limit of mass is small, because if I were to calculate the alpha squared order, there's higher order corrections here, what should I expect if I'm trying to calculate the alpha s over 2 pi square correction? What form should I expect here if I take rho very small? Any guess? You should in principle, all get it right if you followed anything of what I said before. 
I should, well, first of all, I should expect logs, no logs. Log is good. What power? Ah, I have two gluons. How many soft and collinear things can I get? Four. Each of the two gluons can become soft and collinear. Generally speaking, if I go to alpha s to the n, I'm going to get logs of two to the n, or of two logs to the power two n of one over rho. And so that if this thing becomes of order one, truncating the series here or at any finite order for that matters is not going to get you anywhere because you know that the, sub, the, the, the further the terms further down in the, in, the, in the food chain, further down in your series expansion, are going to be equivalently large as the one you have from whatever fixed order perturbation theory you've done. Meaning, you need to do something about this. And doing that in 15 minutes is going to be a real challenge, which, well, I hope I'm going to be able to face. Hopefully there won't be so many things I have to swipe under the rug. First of all, what's the thing you have to consider? You now have to consider any number of soft and collinear gluons, okay? So if any number of gluons, each emitted at an angle theta i and with the momentum fraction z i. And I'm going to consider these as being soft and collinear. Actually, collinear is, is enough uh, for, this, for this purpose. Uh, in that case, it means that you can have any number of real gluons or any number of virtual gluons, okay? One, one way of doing things is actually to introduce a cutoff. So I'm going to say everything has to be at least over some cut of epsilon. So zi's and theta's have to be above a cut of epsilon. In that case, uh, that means everything, real and virtuals are finite per se. And so I know that if I have any number of these gluons, any number of these real gluons, any number of these real gluons is going to give me a sum over any number I have from zero to infinity. That's coming with an alpha s over two pi to the n, a one over n factorials because I can reorder these gluons, their bosons, I can reorder them the way I want. Uh, there's, there's a deeper physical interpretation of this, which is known as angular ordering which means I can actually decide that the ith gluon is at a smaller angle than the ith minus one gluon. It's actually an important uh, property of QCD that you can actually view successive emission uh, as this. I won't have the time to talk about this. Then you'll get an integration from epsilon to one for each of these gluon. I'll get an integration from I, d theta i square over theta i square, integration from epsilon to one, uh, dzi, p of zi. Uh, in, in principle, so I, I've, I've argued that this should be okay in the limit dzi over zi. Actually, it is okay if you keep the rest as well. And so then I have to worry about, and that goes from one to n, what's the value of the mass for each of these n gluon emissions, okay? Uh, you can go back to what I did here. So you have m, which is p plus k1, k2, k n squared. Uh, you'll just get a series of cross products, of dot products, dot products between ki and kj. Well, you can actually simplify this. I, 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 won't, I won't do the math. It's easy to show. And again, easy means it's less than two lines, or three lines maybe. That at the end of the day, what you will get is a theta of the sum over, well, e squared times the sum from i equals one to n z i theta i squared has to be smaller than n squared. Now, with these gluons, I can have any number of virtual gluons, okay? 
we know that the phase space for virtual gluons has to be the same as the phase space for real gluons, otherwise I won't cancel divergences at small t and small z. So this means that virtual gluons will have exactly the same form up to here. Any number of virtual gluons, any integration like this, except that these gluons are not going to contribute to my mass in any way. Okay, so these numbers of gluons, let me call them, I don't know, call them theta i tilde and z i tilde. Uh, the mass of the jet does not depend in any way whatsoever about these z i and theta i variables. So if you just have this expression, what does it look like? Can you solve this sum? Haha. Sum over n, 1 over n factorial, something like this. If they're virtual, each of them are independent, so each of this guy doesn't depend on the other. So if, you, if they're virtual, this is just going to be this integration to the power of n. So it's 1 over n factorial, something to the power of n. This is an exponential, okay? So this is just going to be exponential of minus the integration between epsilon and 1, d, say, theta prime squared or theta prime squared, the integration between 0 and 1, dz i prime, dz prime, p of z prime, alpha s over 2 pi. Uh, introducing epsilon is really what allows me to do this, okay? And then I have to take the limit epsilon going to zero at the end of the day. Here is the physics. Be careful for one minute. Open your ears. I want the maximum number of logs. Logs come from widely separated scales, okay? Whenever I have two different scales, I need logs. How can I achieve the maximum number of logs in this thing? I need to maximally separate my scales. Each time I take two scales of the same order, I'm losing a log, okay? So if I want to have something which is maximally logarithmically divergent, I need all the angles to be widely separated, I need all the values of z to be widely separated, and I need all the values of z i theta i squared to be widely separated. I have two values of z i theta i squared which are of the same order, I'm guaranteed I'm going to lose a log, okay? So this means in particular, I can assume in this expression that among all the values of z i theta i squared, there's one which is way bigger than the others. Okay, otherwise I'm not going to get the maximum number of logs I'm interested in. So this means I can replace this by theta that of, let me again move this to the, to the right hand side and use rho, that the maximum of z i theta i squared is smaller than, uh, I need a factor of, well, than m squared over e squared. And if the maximum of a set is smaller than something, it means that each of the guy need to be smaller than that, oh, I did something wrong in here. Uh, yeah, sorry, if the, if the maximum is smaller than something, it means that each of the guy in the set has to be smaller than the one thing as well. So I can replace this by a product over i, theta of z i theta i squared, smaller than m squared over e squared. Can you do that integration? I've simplified this to something tremendously easy. Don't think about ever getting something simpler than this. Uh, I have something where I have this factor one here goes out, and I'm left with a sum, one over n factorial, times a product over something, which is the integration times the theta function. Each of the element i in this expression does not depend on the others. So this is, again, just this to the power n. This to the power n times one over n factorial, this is an exponential. So this is just the exponential of, there's always an alpha s over 2 pi, integration between, say, z, at this stage it's between epsilon and 1 d theta squared over theta squared dz p of z times minus 1 coming from the virtual corrections plus theta of z i theta i squared smaller than m squared over e squared coming from the real emissions. This 
is minus theta of z i, theta i squared, bigger than m squared over e squared, which is exactly what we had in the one gluon emission calculation. At the end of the day, what I do get is exponential of exactly this gluon calculation here, which is exponential, in, in this precise case, of minus alpha s over 2 pi times alpha s cf over pi times one half log squared one over rho minus three quarters log one over rho. Congratulations, you've just summed the whole series at all orders in perturbation theory. Now I'm going to go back. What approximations here? Lots of approximations. Do I worry about them or don't I worry about them? Remember I've neglected one minus z here, one minus z there. I've neglected factors of one minus z a little bit all over the place. Uh, these are power corrections, I don't care about them. There's one and only one place which I haven't uh, mentioned where things can be complicated. When you start doing expansion and trying to measure what's the value of the mass here, uh, this sum here is only involving emissions, all right? It never depends on a potential recoil angle of the hard quarks. The recoil angle of the hard quarks, I've, I've completely neglected it. Uh, actually, you can show that for the mass, uh, it doesn't matter, it gives you higher power correction. Uh, for other observables, if you try to do the KT, so the transverse momentum with respect to the, uh, to the jet axis, so the transverse momentum is going to be ZI times theta I instead of ZI times theta I squared, this will give you logarithmic power corrections at some order of the perturbation theory, and you will need to worry about this. So beware that sometimes neglecting this one minus z factor or neglecting the recoil which is related to this one minus z factor, recalling the recoil of the hard guy, is something that, generally speaking, will start matter if you go high enough in the, so if, if I'm starting to compute uh, logarithmic corrections beyond uh, this double logarithmic approximation, this, this leading logarithmic approximation. Uh, well, I didn't mention it, this is called a leading logarithmic approximation because, well, just throwing this away, uh, because I've just resumed the dominant, the most, the largest powers of log that I have in my theory, that's the leading logarithmic term, so that's what people refer to as the leading logarithmic approximation. Uh, next to leading would include more subdominant logs and so on and so forth. Uh, so one minus z, I've neglected them. What else have I neglected? Well, from line one, I told you this is, uh, this is collinear. I'm working with small r. Uh, I'm working with small r, so I'm allowed to do collinear physics. So write this down as d theta squared over theta squared times the delta ready per easy splitting function. Uh, will including physics beyond collinear physics modify this behavior? That you should be able to answer. Who thinks it's going to modify it? Why do you think it's going to modify it? No, no, actually, no. You're, you're not the one to ask the question. So everyone else, why do you think it's not going to modify it? The answer is simple, very simple. I told you I want the maximum number of logs. Where do I get those logs? From emissions which are soft and and collinear. So if I'd say some, at some point my emission is not collinear, I'm going to lose some logs. So that's going to give me higher down terms. So these terms here have only term, every single gluon is both soft and both collinear, which means I could actually have done something much more simple from the beginning. I could actually have just replaced this P of Z by CF times 2 over Z. Because they also need to be soft, and if they need to be soft, I can neglect all further complication in the splitting function, all right? Uh, now, what happens if I do include those? Well, first, if I do include, obviously you've seen here, and that's why I did it, you see here that if you keep including terms which are collinear but not soft, so the, further, the terms here further down, they have 
circled here, you do get logs, but less logs. In this case, I have a term here where the, log, the logarithm comes from the integration over theta, but no correction from soft emissions. This is what people refer to as the hard collinear emissions, where I do get one log coming from collinear, no logs coming from, uh, from soft. Actually, this expression here, this expression there, this all order emissions is still valid. So this result is actually valid, including hard collinear emissions. This is, re this is the real answer. Uh, conversely, I can say I can have gluons which are soft, but not collinear, all right? And these would give you, a you should expect this to give you one log of one over rho, plus uh, finite numbers coming from the integration over theta, all right? And finite number coming from the emission over theta, I'm going to take jets which are, uh, gluons which are inside my jets, so finite integration over theta should give me something that scales like a power of theta, of r, presumably r squared, and so in the smaller approximation, I can neglect them. Now, if you start going beyond the smaller approximation, emissions of soft gluons which are not collinear are going to give me corrections to the expressions which are single log times powers of r. But that's further down the food chain compared to the leading log. What other exception have I made? Uh, in principle, there are running coupling corrections, which are actually leading log, usually including leading logs. Uh, there's something else. Uh, this is QED, this is not QCD. If I emit two gluons, what else can I have? So if I emit two gluons, is this the only thing I should worry about? Glue on glue on, or even glue to QQ bar. Neglected here. This is essentially the same result you would have in QED. Should I worry about this? Well, no. Because actually, imagine you want maximum number of logs. If you want maximum number of logs, it means that typically all, everything needs to be soft and collinear. And this means that this gluon needs to be collinear with this one. And in terms of the mass, I don't care. Well, if I have two, gluons, two collinear gluons here or just one collinear gluon here, I don't care. So this is not going to affect the value of the jet mass. So this is not going to matter. Actually, this, the fact that these gluons are actually collinear, you can, you can actually, one way of handling this is to say these are collinear so I can just treat them as part of the gluon, and you can actually re reabsorb them into the uh, running of the coupling. So these, are, uh, these can be reabsorbed into the, cho the, the scheme choice that you use for the running of the coupling, which goes from MS bar to something called CKW. And, uh, and at the end of the day, this gives you subleading this gives you subleading logarithmic contribution as well, where you would have here emissions hard and collinear branchings of, so it's, uh, Hard collinear branchings of this gluon will give you subleading logs as well. At this level, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. The last, so there's, there's two quick points I'd like to mention. The last uh, approximation we've made, so again, whenever you do a calculation like this, you need to go back at the end and make sure what are the approximations I've made, when are they going to start breaking down? So there's value of the observable, that I've assumed the value of the observable was this. I've neglected one minus z corrections and recall correction. They will start matter actually at next to next leaning order. Uh, I've neglected soft emissions at large angle. They will start to matter if I include r square correction. And one thing I haven't mentioned is that they will start to matter in a nasty way. I can have a case where I have one soft gluon emission which is actually emitted outside of my jet, which is going to radiate an emission softer inside your jet. Well, everything here is perfectly simple because I only have all the gluons, they're all inside my jet. This is simple, all local physics. Uh, this thing, you'll get two logs. This is alpha squared log squared because uh, all these gluons are finite angle. And then, uh, and then this one can be much softer than this one, which is much softer here. So it's two soft gluons, alpha squared log squared. This is going to give me, at some order of the perturbation theory, alpha squared log squared is actually next to leading log, uh, the way people do think about this. This is a nasty one. Resumming this to all orders is virtually not done in general. 
can be done in, in the leading log, in the uh, high large NC approximation, can be done semi-numerically. These are called long global logs, and these are a nightmare, one of the nightmares of everyone doing resumation. Uh, last but not least approximation that we've done. I assume that one of the zi theta i squared dominates largely over all the others. In practice, it may not be the case. I can have two of them. I can have n of them, which are, they can all be of the same order. If they're all of the same order, what am I going to get? All the zi theta i squared of the same order. The maximum I can get is if they're all strongly ordered either in energy fixing this or in angle fixing this. So the maximum I'm going to get is alpha s to the n log power to the n, which is again considered an excellent log. So in practice, if you want to go beyond this approximation, you have to keep this. And that's the last remark I want to make because it's a connected, as I told you, I'm going back to these other observables. There are common techniques that people use to deal with this. How do you think you can treat a theta function like this. It no longer exponentiates, right? It's a theta function with a sum. Is there a way to make it exponentiate? Mathematical question. A transform. Which transform? In that case, it's a Mellin transform. So you're going to make a Mellin transform between some form of an imaginary Fourier transform. If you prefer a Fourier transform, would we'll probably cut it as well. You're going to make a Mellin transform, which is going to transform this theta function into an exponential. And this exponential of a sum becomes a product. And you do get something which, at the end of the day, is under an exponential form. OK, well, you have to do the inverse Mellin transform at the end. But you have at least get one step further. So that's my last remark including commanding on the rest, uh, which is there are techniques like Mellin transforms that are routinely used when you want to go to higher orders because they simplify your expressions. A typical example in the same line is threshold logs. I can't remember where I mentioned threshold logarithms. The logarithm of soft collinear, of collinear emissions in X, we know typically from based on the Deglap equation, you have convolutions in X whenever you emit a gluon. These convolutions in X, which are nasty nested integrations, just become simple product if you make a Mellin transform. So doing threshold resummation is usually done in Mellin space going back at the end of the day. What happens if you want to do PT of the Higgs, and that's my last example. If you want to do PT of the Higgs, you'll have have something similar with just so it's soft gluons. So soft gluons can go anywhere. It's a bit more complicated. But at some point, you're going to say, I'm going to emit many soft gluons from, uh, say, from my initial guy. They're going to emit many soft gluons here and there. And you'll have somewhere a delta function that the sum of all these soft gluons has to be equal to the PT of the Higgs. All right? And it's the same kind of thing as you have there. In this case, this type of resummations, it's a two-dimensional sum. This type of resummation is usually done by making a Fourier transform from KT to the, to the Fourier transform, the Fourier conjugate variable, in which case this delta function is going to exponentiate, and you find a way to make the inverse, the inverse Fourier transform at the end. So one, simple exponentiation. That is called a Sudakov factor. The net effect is that at the end of the day, this distribution is going to be killed by this exponential. Prediction from QCD, valid at all orders in this region. If you want to go to higher, so leading order includes both soft and collinear logs, usually easy. You can make all the simplification in the world. You live happy and peaceful life. Going beyond requires work. Uh, known in many cases, actually simple answers in many cases but requires work, including being careful of recoil, being careful of melon space, being careful of everything, uh, it's done. At the end of the day, things like the PT of the Higgs are known to next to next probably leading order distribution matched with next to next leading logarithmic in the perturbation theory. So there's something at the same time gets a high accuracy here and a high accuracy down there, and everyone's happy, and I'm leaving you on this happy note.